of the syllabus um, where it says two calendar of events. The titles that are listed on the right hand side are all chapters from the course book that's at Milman Coffee, okay? And then if you look at reading list and due dates, it says adjunct readings. Those are all books that are, well, it's either this one, which is for weeks one to three, or books that are available at the coop. Okay. And the address for Noman Coffee is uh, 1304 Massachusetts Avenue. All right. And as I said, there's a mixture of uh, analytical psychology texts. That's basically Jungian psychology. Uh, some philosophy, some literature, and some modern neuropsychology. And that basically covers the domain of the course. And so I'll start the introduction now. Okay. This is a course about uh, the causes of social conflict. Uh, I'm not interested in social conflict from the perspective of a political scientist or a sociologist. I'm interested in intergroup conflict, but not at the level of group analysis. I'm interested in what role social identity or group identity plays in individual psychology and why it is that individuals are motivated to participate in acts of social conflict. Um, I am using for an example here the Holocaust. And I was thinking last week, writing part of the preface to the book that you're going to read, about the Holocaust Museum in Washington. There's a lot of, that's a, obviously this is a museum to the, to the Jews primarily who were killed by the Nazis in World War II. And there's a number of museums like this throughout the world. And their central motto is never forget. And this has always been confusing to me, this notion of never forgetting. Because I don't think you can remember something that you don't understand. And I don't think we understand why the Holocaust happened in World War II. Uh, I, think, I think you might regard the Holocaust as an unlearned lesson. And I don't think that you can process information that you don't comprehend. So to say never forget, Begs the question is, what is it that you're supposed to remember? I mean, is it the fact that six million people were killed? Is it, is it the fact of that particular event? Or are you supposed to be giving some consideration to Holocaust-like events that have occurred throughout history? Because there are people who think that what happened in World War II was a relatively unique event. It was something unparalleled in history. This is not a position that I adopt. I think, actually, it's a very common sort of event. Uh, it was perhaps... It was the event of that sort that has proved most shocking to uh, the European conscience, so to speak. But it hardly strikes me as unique. And people often talk about the Holocaust in terms of the relationship between the Jews and the Germans or between the Jews and the Nazis, with the Jews obviously playing the part of victims and the Nazis often are always playing the part of the perpetrators. And of course, this is absolutely comprehensible from the historical point of view. But it also strikes me that if what we remember is that the Nazis killed the Jews, that we're already on the road to making a mistake that's similar to the mistake that was, that was made that led to the Holocaust to begin with, which is to identify characteristics that lead to patterns of action of that sort as characteristics of groups, identifiable groups. And it seems to me, I mean, I'm not trying to equate the role of the Jews and the Nazis in producing the Holocaust. That would obviously be absurd. But what I'm trying to say is that the lesson seems to me to be, especially when you consider that the propensity for Holocaust-like uh, events is deeply rooted in human nature, the, the, the lesson to draw from the events of World War II is that that's what human beings are like, not what the Nazis were like. Because these sorts of events happen all the time. I mean, it's obviously the case that there are, there are well, in the 20th century alone. Well, the English invented the concentration camp in South Africa. Germans perfected it. The Chinese used it to great advantage. Solzhenitsyn estimated, I'll show this on the next slide, that 66 million people in the Soviet Union were killed as a consequence of internal repression, many of whom went through camp-like procedures on their road to their demise. You see ethnic cleansing occurring in places like Rwanda and even once again in Europe, in the Balkans. Whatever it was that we were supposed to have learned from the events of the Second World War hasn't been learned nor been remembered because you can't remember what you don't understand. And that's what this course is about. I'm, I've been working for, since 1985, I guess, on trying to figure out what it is about people 
remember Hannah Arendt, uh, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. She's a famous political scientist. She was a student of Martin Heidegger. She wrote a book called The Banality of Evil, and one of her points was that these people, she was talking about the Nazis in particular, people who perpetrate events like this, if you meet them, if you talk to them, if you have encounter with them, the thing that's often striking about them is not their striking abnormality or their evident evil, but the fact that they're very much like other people that you might have met, which I suppose might not be surprising, so surprising when you think about how thoroughly, for example, the Nazi movement dominated the German consciousness, or likewise with communism in, in the Soviet Union. I mean, those ideological movements characterized people. They didn't characterize some strange sort of misfits whose consciousness was characterized by something incomprehensible that led them to perform the kind of actions that we're theoretically supposed to remember. My, my perspective on all this is that the fact that people are capable of perpetrating atrocities like those that characterize the Holocaust says something about what people are like, what everybody's like. Because it strikes me that that, that kind of tendency is something that's deeply rooted in human nature. And then to say that, but what was it about the Nazis or what was it about the Soviet communists that led them to participate in this sort of behavior is completely beside the point, in a sense. All that does is you're looking for some sort of group characteristic that's devoid, and you don't have any personal relationship with that group. The problem is instantly made abstract, and as far as I'm concerned, if it's abstract, well then, once again, nothing is remembered. Now, what I want to do is to try to, I want to outline the reasons why something like the Holocaust could have occurred, and what it is about us that make us so concerned with protecting our group identities, what those identities mean, what role they play in the regulation of emotion. That's the critical thing right there. For me, ideologies are, are, are the expression, in a sense, the verbal expression of the internal structures that regulate our emotions. When you mess around with someone's ideologies, therefore, as a consequence, you're messing around with the inhibitory structure that regulates the interplay between their emotions. So we're going to study in part in this course of what emotions are and uh, how they're rooted in neuropsychology and neurophysiology and how they manifest themselves in behavior and how they might be controlled and how that might tie into uh, something as abstract as social identity. Usually there's, there's not much of a, a link made between the concept of sociological processes, so to speak, and intrapsychic processes or neuropsychological structures, but it's obvious if you think about it for a moment that whatever your identity is plays some role in regulating your emotional nature and your, and your physiology because your thoughts are embodied, they're part of your mind, they're part of your brain <coughs> if you want to get right down to it. People have belief systems and they'll do anything to protect them and I find that peculiar. What is it that's so important about a belief system that would lead people to do things, normal people, as far as I'm concerned, to commit acts that under normal circumstances would, would be conceived of as incomprehensible even by those people? So I also hope that to make, as I said, I want to make the lessons here personal. I, I'm not interested in discussing the issue from the abstract perspective because I don't think that an issue, an issue of this magnitude deserves to be discussed at, a, at an abstract level. It's not an abstract problem. It's something, there's something peculiar about us that we have to learn to control because as far as I'm concerned, we're too technologically powerful to remain at the whims of the uncomprehended aspects of our nature. Peace, predictability, and the delusion of self-representation uh, what does that mean? Well, if you can predict something as a general rule, it's hard to determine why it is that you think you understand something when you think you do. If you think about it for a moment, it gets complicated because you're surrounded by things that at some level of analysis you cease to understand. It doesn't matter what, what phenomenon it is. I mean, even, even the most mundane objects become mysterious if you look into them far enough. I mean, take something as simple as a chair, it's made out of wood. I mean, that's all, that, that, that's, there's nothing remarkable about that, but if you start to look into the structure of the wood and how the organism, the tree produced it, and all the chemical reactions that go about bringing that about and the developmental history that led to the, to the 
uh, emergence of, of plants and trees, well, you can see that even in something mundane, there are embedded all sorts of mysteries, but for the large part, we create a chair or something we understand. That, well, that's in part because we're only concerned with it with regards to its function. And if it serves the function of being able to be sat upon, then we don't pay any more attention to it. Uh, so we think that if we can predict the behavior of something, that we understand it. So, in peace, when we observe ourselves acting peacefully, we presume that we've got ourselves under control, that we actually do understand well, each other because we can predict the behavior of others and we can predict our own behavior. And that deludes us into thinking that therefore our models of ourselves are actual, actually accurate representations of what we're like. Well, the problem is in wartime we don't act like we do in times of peace, but then of course during wartime when people are committing uh, violent and socially aggressive acts. They don't really have all that much time to sit around and self-reflect. So it's not time to be, to be building models about who it is that you are and why it is that you're that way. You're too busy doing whatever it is that you happen to be involved in to protect your territory or to take someone else's territory or to, to expand your ideological dominion or whatever it is. In peaceful times, we look at ourselves and we see ourselves behaving peacefully and predictably and and nicely, and we make the presupposition that as a consequence, that's what we're like, and that we also understand ourselves. This is a big mistake. Because if you put someone under extreme circumstances, then there will be things about them that will be revealed to them that can only be revealed under extreme circumstances. And it's extreme circumstances that we're concerned about in the course of this course. I want to find out. See, I think that one of the things that ideology does, and group identity for that matter, is regulate our emotions. And if you're a member of a community that has a successful ideology, and so the social structure is basically stable and successful, then your emotions are regulated so well that you don't even know that they're there. Which is to say that you're protected by something that you don't understand from something that you don't comprehend. And what I want to do is open the gates a little bit and let you see what's underneath your comfortable social identities and what it is that you're protected from by the weight of your history. Well, this is the central question, I guess, that... Like, first of all, I think social aggression is a primary human characteristic. If you even have a cursory knowledge of human history, it's obviously the case that warfare plays an immense role. And it seems to be the case that this is also true down the phylogenetic ladder. I mean, for a long time it was thought, for example, that chimpanzees live peaceably. And this appears to be the case. As long as you study chimpanzees within their own family or kin unit, or, or I suppose, roughly speaking, tribe, they behave peaceably to each other. Even in their dominance, dominance disputes are usually settled more or less peacefully. But Goodall discovered not so long ago that chimpanzees conduct wars, and plan wars by, by all occurrences. And, and that when a chimp group is faced with an interloper from another group, or with another group that they're capable of engaging in the same sort of behavior at a much, much more fundamental level in the sense that we are. And it also seems to be the case, as we'll see a little bit later in this discussion, that similar things are true. Even animals as, as simple, so to speak, as rats. Uh, it looks like the capacity for so is strange, it's strange, because it's obvious that people have a tremendous capacity for social affiliation. I mean, we make groups. In the West, people are usually considered as you know, rugged individualists, so to speak. But it's, all, it's the case even in the most individualistic of societies that we're constantly in contact with other people. Almost all our environment is other people. We're all members of, of literally often dozens of groups, families and, and groups devoted towards certain tasks and, and so on and so forth. We're very, very, very social, thrive in a social community. But it looks like the flip side of that is the fact that we're so capable of making social groups also makes us very capable of organized aggression against other social groups, so it's a, it's a strange phenomenon that it's our very capacity for social organization that also gives us this terrible capacity for social aggression. So that's another thing that I want to take a look at in the course. Like, I really want to get at the core of this, too. I, like I said it, it, a little while ago, I'm not interested in messing around with the question on an abstract level. I want to end the course with a concrete answer about why it is that people are capable of doing the sorts of things that characterize Nazi behavior, say, during the Holocaust. I want to make that so crystal clear that you can map out the argument from presupposition A to, to conclusion D, so that it's socially and personally applicable, and so that you also get a glimpse, perhaps, of what might be necessary 
from the perspective of personal and interpersonal conduct to alleviate the likelihood that you'll get trapped into doing something like that. So one of the things you pointed out, because he was very concerned with the events of the Second World War and, and social aggression in general, he said, what you have to understand is that these great evils tend to take place one small step at a time. The people get trapped into them over a long period of time. They make a small bad error, but, but it doesn't look so big at the time. That leads to another type of error that's not so big as well, and that leads to a third error, and it's not so big, but if you put together 40 of those errors or 50 of those errors, then all of a sudden you see that someone's traveled down a road to a place where they might not want to have gone in the beginning had they been conscious of it. So one of the things about never forgetting is to understand is to engage in primary prevention, so to speak, which is to understand how the slips in the second half of the course has to do with, with that issue in particular. Personal relationship to group identity and group fostered action. So the first part of the course basically deals with why it is that we're susceptible to social aggression as a consequence of our biological makeup. What it is about us that makes us like that. And the second part of the course is about how certain patterns of personal conduct heighten the possibility that socially aggressive acts will take place and about how it is that you might avoid engaging in those sorts of acts. That's just a, an overhead that details some of the things I've already discovered. It's a good poem here. I'm going to tell you a story from the Soviet Union that Solzhenitsyn told. He introduces it with the poem from the Russian poet Mayakovsky, who was a Soviet sympathizer. With cohesion, construction, grit, and repression bring the neck of this gang run riot. That's a nice poem. Well, Solzhenitsyn wondered, well, who was the gang? That's the question. And as I said, he estimated. 66 million people died in the Soviet Union between 1917 and 1959. Solzhenitsyn also estimated that a substantially larger number perished in communist China, but no one really knows the stats on that. Now, this is a debatable statistic, as Solzhenitsyn points out in his book. This is from the Gulag Archipelago, but as he said, as soon as the official statistics are released, he'll revise his estimates. Now, this includes, for example, several millions, million peasants pushed into the tundra and forced relocation in the early 20s and 6 million Ukrainians, I believe it was 6 million, dead in the famines in the 1930s. Anyways, let me read you this story. <coughs> okay, so this is the situation. Solzhenitsyn, I should tell you a little bit about his life story. The Gulag Archipelago is a three volume book, the second volume of which you will read. Um, it's his story about the Gulag. And the Gulag was a system of forced labor camps that was set up by the, in the Soviet Union soon after Lenin died. In fact, I guess some of them were set up before he died, and upon which the Soviet economy really ran for much of its much of what constituted its life. Now Solzhenitsyn started his travels through the Gulag originally as a Russian frontline soldier. It's a neat story in a sense. He got thrown into a German prisoner of war camp. And when he was repatriated to the Soviet Union, Stalin threw him in a, in a concentration camp. And the reason was, as he did with all the returned Russian prisoners of war, who were treated, by the way, terribly in the German prisoners of war camps because Stalin refused to sign the Geneva Convention on the treatment of prisoners. So not only were they in prisoners of war camps, which was miserable enough, but they were starved to the degree that the other allied prisoners used to give them food. They didn't have much food themselves. So he was a frontline soldier, then he got thrown in the German prisoner of war camp, and then when he finally returned to Russia, Stalin threw him in a concentration camp. And the reason for that was that the Russians who were in German prisoners of war camp had been contaminated by their exposure to Western ideas. That was his rationale. So anyways, then he spent a decade and a half or thereabouts in concentration camps, and when he got out, he developed stomach cancer. So that's you know, a brief summary of 
some of the highlights of his life. Okay, in this scene, he's being transported from one camp to another in a, in a, a railway car that's been roughly outfitted for transporting human beings. He's sitting with a friend that he calls Pan, and I'm just going to read you this story. My friend Patton and I are lying on the middle shelf of a Stolopin compartment. That's one of these cattle cars, basically, they are refitted for human transport. And have set ourselves up comfortably, tucked our salt herring in our pocket so we don't need water and can go to sleep. But at some station or other, they shove into our compartment a Marxist scholar. We can tell this from his goatee and spectacles. He doesn't hide the fact, so he's been arrested. He's a devout communist, but he's been arrested by the communists. He doesn't hide the fact he's a former professor of the communist academy. We hang head down in the square cutout, and from his very first words, we see that he is impenetrable. But we have been serving time for a very long time, and have a long time left to serve, and we value a merry joke. We must climb down and have a bit of fun. There's ample space left in the compartment, so we exchange places with someone and crowd in. Hello. Hello. You're not too crowded? No, it's all right. Have you been in the jug a long time? Long enough. Are you past the halfway mark? Just. Look over there, how poverty-stricken our villages are. Straw thatch, crooked huts. Well, that's an inheritance, an inheritance from the czarist regime. But we've already had 30 Soviet years. That's an insignificant period historically. It's terrible that the collective farmers are starving. But if you look in all the rubbers, just ask any collective farmer in our compartment. Well, everyone in jail is embittered and prejudiced. But I've seen collective farms myself. That means they were uncharacteristic. The goatee had never been in any of them. That way it was simpler. Just ask the old folks. Under the czar, they were well fed, well clothed, and they used to have many holidays. I'm not even going to ask. It's a subjective trait of human memory to praise everything in the past. The cow that died is the one that gave twice the milk. Sometimes he even cited Proverbs. And our people don't like holidays. They like to work. But why is there a shortage of bread in many cities? When? Right before the war, for example. Not true. Before the war, everything, in fact, had been worked out. Listen, at that time, in all the cities on the Volga, there were queues of thousands of people. A local failure in supply. More likely, your memory is failing you. But there's a shortage now. Old wives' tales, we have from 7 to 8 billion bushels of grain. But the grain is rotten. Not so. We've been very successful in developing new species of grain. And so forth. He's imperturbable. He speaks in a language which requires no effort of the mind. And arguing with him is like walking through a desert. It's about people like that that they say, he made the rounds of all the blacksmiths and came home unshod. And when they write in their obituaries, perished tragically during the period of the Stalinist cult. This should be corrected to read, perished comically. But if his fate had worked out differently, we would have never learned what a dry, insignificant little man he really was. We would have respectfully read his name in the newspaper. We would have, he would have become a people's commissar, or even ventured to represent all Russia abroad. To argue with him was useless. It was much more interesting to play with him. Not at chess, but at the game of comrades. There really is such a game. It's a very simple game. Play up to him a couple of times or so. Use some of his own pet words and phrases. He'll like that. For he's grown accustomed to find that all around him are enemies. He's become weary of snarling and doesn't like to tell his stories because all of them will be twisted and thrown right back in his face. But if he takes you for one of his own, he will quite humanly disclose to you what he has seen at the station. People are passing by, talking, laughing. Life goes on. The party is providing leadership. People are being moved from job to job. Yet you and I are languishing here in prison. There are only a handful of us, and we must write and write petitions, begging a review of our cases, begging for a pardon. Or he will tell you something interesting. In the Communist Academy, 
they decided to devour one comrade. They decided he wasn't quite genuine, not one of our own, but somehow they couldn't manage it. There were no errors in his essays, and his biography was clean. Then all of a sudden, going through the archives, what a find! They ran across an old brochure written by this comrade in which Vladimir Ilyich Lenin himself had held in his hands and in the margin of which he had written in his own handwriting the notation as an economist is shit. Well, now you understand, our companion smiled confidentially, but after that it was no trouble at all to make short work of that muddlehead and foster. He was expelled from the academy and deprived of his scholarly rank. This story uh, is a, a perfect example of the kind of phenomena that I'm interested in trying to understand. A communist professor in this exchange, he doesn't think, doesn't have to think, because he has an ideological system that's entirely worked out. He won't admit that any evidence whatsoever exists to suggest that some of his presuppositions are wrong. For every bit of evidence that exists, there is a counter-argument that justifies it or excuses it or makes it disappear in some way. That's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is that being like this, he's also extraordinarily clannish in a sense. And he tells a brief story about being in the Communist Academy where everyone shares ideology and finding the outsider so that he can essentially destroyed. There are specific reasons why the two halves of that narrative were stuck together. Because the first attitude leads inexorably to the second attitude, which is to say the adoption of uh, an authoritarian ideology, which is basically the presumption of omniscience in a sense. As if you're an ideologue, you think that what you think is the right thing to think. There isn't anything else that needs to be thought it's you that has the answer now. You might not think it's you. You might not think that it's your leader or the ideology in and of itself. But the point is, you're the one that's in possession of the absolute truth. And every fact that might exist to dispute that is eliminated. Now, the problem with eliminating facts is that sometimes they come in embodied form, which is to say, we tend to think of ideas as disembodied, abstracted entities. But the truth of the matter is that Ideas are representations of human patterns of action, and sometimes the enemy idea is actually the enemy. And there's very little difference from the practical perspective between repressing facts that are uncomfortable and repressing people whose viewpoints or even styles of existence are equally uncomfortable. So this is another example of the sort of thinking that I want to explain. I want to explain the motivation for that. Why is it that someone would adopt a rigid ideological position and then defend it, sometimes to their own death, but more frequently to the death of others? And to feel that not only is that, is that uh, acceptable, but often even morally justifiable. It's the thing that should be done. You're a good patriot, so to speak. So this is the question. This is, this is what I want to address in the course, basically. And I don't want, like I said, I said, I mean, I don't want to take a stab at the questions, so to speak. I don't want to beat around the bush with them. I want to answer these so that when you're finished the course, you know what purpose group identification serves, why it's so important to people, how it developed, what it means to have a belief have beliefs. We never really question, I guess, what it means. When you say that I have a belief, I think the world is a particular way as opposed to some other particular way. So why do we feel threatened when the groups we identify with are challenged? Why does challenge make us aggressive and righteously aggressive? That's sort of the core, I guess those are the core questions that the course centers around. There's more. I can't describe the whole course, obviously, in this first lecture. This is about half the, half the story. Uh, I'm also interested in 
how our own personal behaviors make our group identification more or less dangerous and what can be done about that as well. <clears throat> Okay, so, to understand why we are capable of atrocious behavior, we have to understand how we think. And I want to approach that from a variety of different perspectives. I'm going to give you initially a grounding in modern neuropsychology, neuropsychology of emotion and emotional regulation, because that'll, that puts the discussion on what I think is a firm foundation. I, mean, I said I bring in analytical ideas and ideas from literature and philosophy as well, but it's nice to also have reference to some facts that are acceptable as facts. Um, that's why we start to finish with neuropsychology. Well, how do we think this is half the story? We'll discuss the other half as we go through the course. The course is predicated on a theory of knowledge that suggests that we classify objects and situations according to two separate types of schemes. And the first type of scheme is one that everyone is essentially familiar with. Uh, that's the scientific scheme that makes the presupposition that there's an objective world that's apprehensible to the senses that can be collectively described, which is only to say that the thing is real, and if you can sense it, which usually means if you can touch it most fundamentally or see it, or in some other way detect it, if you can describe the procedures by which that detection occurred, and if someone else duplicating those procedures comes up with the same observations. And that's a real thing, that's a fact, it's a scientific fact. And we've been able to codify a methodology for determining what is from the objective perspective. And I don't think there's, there's no real reason to dispute that. It seems more or less self-evident. It's a relatively new procedure. We've only been really good at it for 500 years at the most. It's only been that long since the scientific enterprise has been transformed into something that was actually codified. It's obviously an extraordinarily efficient way to proceed. And there's no point, in a sense, in debating its utility. That's one type of um, knowledge scheme. But there's another type that people have spent much less time formalizing, partly because it's more difficult to formalize, but with regards to the scientific method, we more or less have a set of agreed upon rules by which the endeavor should proceed, and also by which to judge the validity of the outcomes of the procedures. You can write them down. They're very much formalized. That's why almost anybody can do scientific research, especially the type of scientific research that Thomas Kuhn described as normal, which basically means that you have a set theory which you're not trying to challenge. You're working within the theory to more or less flesh it out. So you're a, a technician putting to work potent technical tools that you can virtually do by rote. Anyway, so we figured out how to formalize that. That's an answer to the question, what is? how to control things. The second type of information, that's the type that I'm concerned with in this course. And that is not what a thing is from the objective perspective, but about what it is from the perspective of determining its implications for behavior. You say, well, there are things, and there is also knowledge about how to behave in their presence. The first kind of information you might consider <coughs> the second kind of information is more akin to what has been traditionally described as wisdom. Because wisdom is the knowledge of how to conduct yourself. Uh, things exist, and the fact of their existence has implications for behavior. And it's the implications of the existence of things for behavior that I want to focus on. Because in our social communities, we come to agreements over vast stretches of time about what sorts of behaviors are to be considered appropriate, in which situations, and under which conditions. And it's this agreement that lends predictability to our interpersonal relationships. We can take an example just of this course. Uh, we all share a map, so to speak, 
of what behaviors are appropriate in a situation like this. And essentially what that means is that we can come in here and conduct our business. And we all know what that business is going to be. There's no dispute about that. And we all know, more or less, what our respective roles are going to be in conducting that business. There's no, re there's no space for dispute at all, which basically means that our shared map of the significance of the events that are occurring in this room eliminates the need for conflict. We don't even have, we don't have to fight about what's going to happen in here. We don't have to fight about who owns that sun-kissed orange juice, or who's going to take control of the pens, or who owns that particular computer, or who's going to, or how the, how the discussion is going to proceed. That's all mapped out for us in some ways. And that means that we've rendered ourselves in this particular situation predictable, which means that there's no reason for any of us to regard any of the other people in the room with any sort of apprehension whatsoever. So in a sense, you could say that for me, you're a fixed object in terms of your significance in this environment. And the reason for that is because we're engaging in a culturally determined process, none of which we're questioning, or at least that we've, we've accepted implicitly, well, explicitly and implicitly. You're at a university. This is what happens at a university. You know that. I know that. We don't have to set any of the ground <coughs> rules. Well, it's our shared apprehensions about the implications of situations for behaviors that constitute our cultures. And it's those shared maps that bring predictability to our interpersonal relationships. And what that essentially, you can only understand that if you understand what the world is like when it's not predictable. And it's difficult to understand that for modern people who live in peaceful times because our culture is so successful at regulating our interpersonal behavior, and even the environment for that matter, that we hardly ever encounter a situation where anything remotely unpredictable happens. So you can't tell what it's like to be faced with something that's unpredictable. So you don't know what it's like when you're in an environment where culture doesn't reign, because you're part of a successful community and you're extraordinarily well protected. You're like, you're like a, a boy that lives inside a castle. You can't see over the walls, it doesn't even know that they're there. There's all sorts of terrible things outside the castle, but everything inside is peaceful. And that's the world. And the boy has no idea what he would be like if he went outside into the real world where things were actually unpredictable because he's only had a chance to observe his behavior under stable conditions where everything's predictable and acceptable. It's even worse now, in a sense. It's better in a way, too. I mean, it is peaceful now in many ways. I mean... Even compared to 15 years ago, there's much less ideological dispute in the world about how to conduct affairs than there was, say, in the, in the mid-70s. And people have more or less, I mean, I know there's exceptions to this, but people the world over have more or less accepted the necessity, for example, for a market economy. There aren't very many ideologies that appear attractive, even in the imagination, in contrast to, to Western-style democracies. And I mean, that's a pretty recent occurrence, and it's unlikely to last for any great length of time, I think, but... It is peaceful now, and, and that, that, the fact of that peace makes it even more difficult for us to either to understand ourselves or to be sufficiently motivated to understand ourselves. You know? Because when things are going really well and everything's predictable, then you presume that you know what you're doing. In fact, that's the basis on which you, ju you base your judgments about whether you know what you're doing. If you perform a procedure and what you predicted occurs, you're right. Now, that doesn't mean you know everything, but as far as you're concerned, that's sufficient. So, anyways, the fundamental point is this. We share a map of the significance of things and situations, including other people, including ourselves. And that maps our culture. And one of the lines of arguments that I want to develop throughout the course of this course is that that shared culture takes the form of a story. In fact, that's what a story is. A story is a description of the significance of situations or events for behavior. And a story is the kind of information, a story is a form of information that transmits abstractly uh, knowledge about how to act. So you have on the one hand scientific descriptions, that are descriptions of facts, things that are sensory apprehensible to a collective. And you have another form of information, that's narrative. And a narrative contains information about how you should conduct yourself literally how you should propel your body through space under which circumstances. And a shared narrative constitutes a culture. Now, let's see. let me show you what I think the basic structure of a story is. Okay. 
scientific description is concerned with what is. And then we have rules for determining that. A story is concerned with what is, but not from the perspective of the senses, but from the perspective of implications for behavior. Okay, so that's the meaning, essentially. Things have an existence and a meaning, and the story is concerned with the meaning. And meaning is a description of the current state, a description of the ideal future state, and a description of the means of transformation. I'll show you this a little diagram. You run a fantasy of any sort through your head. So you have a plan. A plan, a plan that's relevant to some determination of action. You just want to go down to the corner store to get a loaf of bread. You conceive of yourself here as lacking something necessary. You apprehend in the abstract an ideal goal, which is your trip down to the store, and you also formulate plans of how to get there. And you, you evaluate occurrences on the way to the store in relationship to, to your idealized future. Just to say that anything that gets in your way, basically, on the way to the store, if you're in a hurry, for example, that's regarded as an inconvenience. Anything that hurries you along, that's regarded as something positive. Which is basically to say that you use your apprehension of the ideal future, which is always construed in relationship to your present conditions, as the schema by which you determine the significance of things. Because you're always construing the meaning of things in relationship to what you want to do in relationship to the function. And this basically constitutes the whole, the whole story, in a sense. Uh, at least the simple version of it. just stop there for a second and ask people if they have any questions and then the next thing I want to do is give you a really brief overview of how your brain determines how things should be evaluated in terms of their emotional relevance. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? Are the, are the, are the quote that you put up, uh, what is the, the ring, the, the neck of the, the, the gang rung right? Is that the, the Ring the neck of the right, or ring the neck of the people that are under the, uh, under the that are being well, exposed. Well, it was to a like that. That poem was a, a comment by a poet. I think his name was Poniatowski on the necessity of eliminating dissent. So, like the, this, you could think the Soviet Union, for example, ran on a number of five-year plans. That the five-year plans were, you know, we're gonna, we are here, we're gonna get to here. Uh, here are the means by which that's going to be done then anybody who was viewed as deviating from that plan, of course, was instantly regarded as a threat. And Mayakovsky was saying, well, those are the gang run riot fundamentally. Anybody who doesn't agree with the forward motion of the current society is instantly regarded, well, they're instantly regarded fundamentally as an anomaly, but more, more pragmatically as a threat. And Mayakovsky was making the point that those people, they should be eliminated. They deserve to be eliminated, which is even, you know, even a, uh, uh, a further step, in a sense. They constitute the class of things that deserves to be annihilated because it's construed in relationship to some ideal. Say, you, you might be wondering, why, why the hell is this a story? What does this have to do with the story? Well, I can give you the most, the most fundamental example in a sense. I, I want to tell you what stories are, and then I want to take a look at their substructure because, well, the fact that there's a substructure to stories is evident in a number of subtle ways. Partly evident because myths that have been collected throughout the world have a remarkably similar nature. That's one, one bit of information that's relatively curious. It's also very strange that people like stories. Children will listen to stories without any external reinforcement. They're intrinsically rewarding. People watch TV all the time because TV is full of stories. We pay to go see movies. We'll buy novels. There's something about stories that are intrinsically attractive to the point that will actually work to be allowed to become in, in, to be in contact with them, which should beg the question, since we're willing to go to all that trouble to, to look at stories and to receive them, perhaps they're actually serving some function. I mean, it seems at least, at least reasonable. 
in the function they're serving it, basically. And that's what I'm trying to point out is that a story, good story is what regulates your emotion. And if you share a story with someone else, then you can predict them and both your emotions are regulated. And if a group of you shares a story, then you have a culture. And you're all more or less predictable to one another. So it's very useful because then you can be organized and you can move forward in one direction and so on. But mostly you're predictable to one another. Say. To make the story aspect of this more comprehensible, you might think of this as political utopia. That's one way of doing it. Or as a vision of paradise. And then that's the archetypal aspect that underlies the notion that the future could, in fact, be better than the present. I mean, even in trivial ways, we're doing this all the time. We're always moving from a state that we conceive of as not entirely ideal towards a state that we conceive of, even in the smallest ways, as somehow better than where we were. And that's the sort of thing that, in fact, gives us impetus to move forward in, in a literal sense. But underlying that is the notion, way under, so to speak, is the notion that the world as it is presently constructed is somehow in need of redemption. And there is a state, a hypothetical state, that exists somewhere in the future, so to speak, or somewhere at least, towards which the world could move. In all religious stories, all religious systems share that sort of notion, political utopias as well. I mean, it's really evident in the case of of something like communism, because communism was always trying to establish uh, the kingdom of God on earth, so to speak, although, of course, without, theoretically, without the religious overtones. They, of course, were just made implicit instead of, instead of being allowed to be, to be explicit, because Stalin was as close to a god, and a pretty miserable one, as any religion has managed to, uh, to construct. This is a simple story, basically. Stories have a slightly more complicated structure than this, which we'll discuss later. How would you distinguish, or how do you distinguish between a strategy and a story? This would be a strategy yeah. in here. A strategy is just, that's a good question. This is actually, this is somewhat simpler than the real structure, because in a sense, each of these strategies yeah. is this whole structure in a smaller sense. So you could say this structure is composed of smaller units like this all the way down. And I don't know how far down, I haven't been able to figure that out, but like, because every goal can be conceptualized as viewed of sub-goals that have the same notion. But for, for the purposes of the present discussion, this is a sufficient, sufficient representation. But that's something we'll, that specific issue we'll talk about more in the latter part of the, the latter part of the course, because the fact that a story is made up of sub-stories right down to the lowest level of resolution has implications for, well, for certain forms of mythological representations. Representations of trees, actually. I don't want to, I don't want to get into that at the moment. So, anyways, that's the story. You said, I put up there the domain and constituent elements of the known. Well, I think that's kind of an odd title for a diagram like this, but I would say that from the perspective of the regulation of emotion, a story about where you are and where you'd like to get to and how you're going to do that, that is what you know. So remember, we're not in the domain of facts here, it's construed from the scientific perspective. We're in the domain of wisdom, of behavioral knowledge. And what you know is where you are, where you want to be, and theoretically how to get there. So, I'll, I'll explain this in some more detail later. Yeah. Where are you on that question? Yeah, oh sure, absolutely. Okay, so I said the first thing we're going to do is describe in some detail how the brain works. And uh, I want to do that because I want to give you some insight into how it is that we process emotional information. And you need to know that we think in stories before you can actually understand how it is that we process emotional information. So I'm going to put up a somewhat complicated diagram. Remember, basically, that it'll take three weeks to discuss this. This is basically a brief thing. Okay, but here's, here's the idea. Yeah. It's not as complicated as it looks. Okay, at the top, well, this is a circle, but, and you can start anywhere in a circle, but we'll start at the top. It's how you process information. Well, obviously, the bottom line is that you have a certain amount of sensory input. Okay. That sensory in input is interpreted with regards to its significance as a consequence of 
its interaction with what you already know, which is basically to say that your present, which is which constitutes the sensory information theoretically that's impinging on you at, at this moment, is not a veridical picture of the external world, but your interpretation of reality as it's unfolding. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make a point that there's no such thing as an external reality or that you're living in a delusion or any of those things, just that you're always interpreting what's going on in relationship to its significance to you. And you have models, you're, it's models that are doing that. You have theories about what someone's like, what you're like, and what the situation consists of, and what you should be doing next. And all of the input that you have that constitutes your online experience is a function of your interpretation. It's based on actual information, but it's still a function of interpretations. Okay, so we use your declarative memory, that's one form of memory storage, to construct your version of the present. That's the significance of things as they're unfolding at the present time. You can only really you can only really make judgments about the significance of things by contrasting them with what you would like to happen. So that's your image of the, of the desired future. Okay. If, you're, if you're doing something that's even, that's very simple. Well, let me give you an example. There are experiments where people's task is to pick up an object. And they can see the object in front of them. Okay, so you're given the task, that's the basic story, the story is, what you're required to do is to transform yourself from the person you are now into the person who has uh, possession of that watch. It's just a standard laboratory experiment. But the watch is actually not there. It's an image that's generated by mirrors. And when you move towards the watch, you find that it's not where it appears to be. Well. The fact of the object not being where it appears to be is an anomaly with regards to your current plan. And you'll react to that emotionally. The first thing that will happen is that, well, obviously you're going to be surprised, right? You think, this is pretty easy. I'm going to pick that up and you find out that the thing that you see is not actually there. That's an anomaly. You say, well, you contrasted your desired future, which was your aim when you moved your arm, with the actual outcome of your actions. That's a mismatch. So part of your brain called the hippocampus that seems to be responsible for comparing what's actually going on insofar as you can interpret that with what you want to happen. And if, if a mismatch occurs, that sets up a whole sequence of related events. And those re events manifest themselves in emotion and in thought and in behavior. Most evidently in emotion. If you're going to do something, you've done it before, and it doesn't work out the way you expected it to, the events that constitute the anomaly, the unexpected occurrence, they're surprising. And the question then is, what does surprising mean? Well, it basically means that something threatening has occurred, and something, well, something unknown has taken place. So what does the unknown mean? Well, the thing about the unknown is that you don't know what it means. It's pretty, that's a pretty straightforward statement. But, you see, that immediately, that immediately introduces a strange sort of paradox, because you lack infinite information. Obviously, people don't know what they're doing all the time, which means that you come into contact with things that you don't understand a lot. And that means, in a sense, that you have to know what to do when you don't know what to do, because you don't know what to do a lot. And that doesn't, doesn't just bring you to a halt. What well, is the case that your nervous system is hardwired to move to a sort of default position when the plans, that the explicit plans that you have that you're carrying out fail. So as long as you could say in a sense, as long as you know what you're doing, which means that you have a representation of where you are and where you'd like to be. You're carrying out your plans to make the move and things are going according to plan. Well, as long as you're doing that, then the higher centers in your, of your brain, the cortex, basically, it's under control. You know what you're doing. You feel comfortable and secure. As soon as something unexpected happens, the control shifts, and this is something that's basically beyond your capacity to control, though you can interfere with the process. Control shifts from the cortical centers to the more fundamental areas of the brain, to the limbic system. When something unexpected happens, two things occur. You stop, you feel a little bit of anxiety. It depends on how unexpected the occurrence is. If it's really unexpected, you'll be very, very frightened. If it's just minor, something minor, league, unexpected, you'll just stop. Your sensory 
processing will heighten, you'll gather more information, and you'll explore. And as you explore, you generate information, and the information is supposed to bring you back on course, basically. So you'll say, um, well, what you'll do if you're trying to reach for the watch and you find out that it isn't where you think it is, well, you'll start making different sorts of approach sequences until you end up producing the outcome that you intended. When something unexpected occurs, two sets of circuitry are activated. One looks like it's dominated by the right hemisphere, and the other looks like it's dominated by the left hemisphere. Unexpected things make you anxious and curious, and you can localize those emotions in the body, so to speak. Anxiety is the emotion that accompanies the cessation of your body's planned, directed activities. That's, you could say that anxiety is what you feel when you slip into the mode of pause. Pause for further analysis. What you expected to do didn't happen, so you have to stop. Curiosity is what you feel when it's necessary for you to explore further, to gather new information, to update your plans. And exploration is basically governed by the interplay of the circuitry, brain circuitry that mediates anxiety and curiosity. Curiosity, by the way, that's associated with positive emotions. And anxiety, as you all well know, is associated with that's a negative emotion. People would rather not experience it. Curiosity, or surprise, is basically a juxtaposition of those two sets of emotions, which work antagonistically. The unknown produces conflict all by itself. That's the, in, in a sense, and it, it's kind of early to introduce this, but that's the, the central um, theme, in a way, of the whole course, is that you have a hardwired response to the emergence of the unexpected. You have to, because you have to know what to do when something unexpected occurs. It's instinctive. Your instinctive response to the unknown is anxiety plus curiosity, which is to say cessation of ongoing motor activity plus a drive to move forward and explore. And your exploratory activity is actually the sum total of the activation of the two sets of circuitry that mediate that response. And when you explore, if you explore, if something unexpected happens, you don't have to explore. You can note it and get the hell out of there. It's safe, but you don't gather any new information. It's a good short-term strategy. It's not a good long-term strategy. But anyways, the point is, is that surprise activates curiosity. That impels you forward. You generate new information. You update your plan, and soon you can get to where you want it to go. And the point is that mismatch between what you expect to happen and what actually happens, that disinhibits anxiety. If mismatch occurs, there's a little suborgan in your brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala looks like it's responsible for the addition of emotion to sensory experience. Now, behavioral psychologists have presumed in the past, most psychologists have presumed, particularly behaviorists, that you learn to be afraid. Newer models of the neuropsychology of emotion reverse that presupposition and say, no, you know how to be afraid. Anything that you don't expect makes you afraid. That's your default position. What you have to learn is how to be secure. Now, by the time you're an adult, you've learned how to be secure so well, under most circumstances, under secure circumstances, you've learned how to be secure so well that you don't realize that your a priori or default position is fear. You're, co you're so well enculturated assuming you're successful, that the true nature of your emotional responses is in, a, is in a sense hidden from you, which is precisely as it's supposed to be, because the whole purpose of socialization, the whole purpose of learning is in fact to shut off the circuitry that says something of indeterminate significance is occurring now. People do not like it when that circuitry is activated. Not, not, not it. That's, a, that's, a, that's a bit in error, because people like to explore. You like novelty in small doses. Small, controllable doses, it's like food. It's when something truly unexpected occurs that uproots or upsets your plans that anxiety really becomes disinhibited. People like that less than anything else. Anyways, the amygdala labels things that are unexpected as simultaneously threatening and promising. That basically puts you into an approach avoidance conflict. So, what does that mean? It means that anything unpredictable is not neutral. Anything unpredictable is frightening. Now, that, that 
in and of itself immediately sheds a certain amount of light on why it is that we're somewhat loath to accept people whose behaviors we can't predict as one of us. People who are from a culture that's different from ours, for example, who have a story about how things should go that runs differently from ours, their behavior cannot be predicted with certainty. And you, you're, you are instinctively wired, so to speak, to label unpredictable behavior as threatening. And I think you can think about this in really concrete terms. And you can experience this sort of thing regularly, for example, on a stroll through Harvard Yard. In North, like, if you look around you, you're all decked out in symbols, so to speak, that indicate your particular status and goal-directed nature in a community such as this. You're all relatively well-dressed. You're all relatively, no, no, it's all it's intended. Uh, you're all well-groomed. You're attentive. And your behavior is very much indistinguishable from one another. You're all participating in the same sort of ritual. And there, there's... There's no reason for you to view your neighbors sitting beside you with any degree of suspicion, because you're convinced that you can predict them. But if you take a walk through somewhere like Harvard Square, where there are people who have, in a sense, fallen out of the culture, so there are people there who are mentally ill, some of them are schizophrenic, many of them are alcoholic, they're homeless for one reason or another, they're hard on your guilt, if nothing else, but they're also unpredictable. And you'll find that people do standard things in the face of unpredictable others. They tend to avoid them walk around them, or at least to feel very uncomfortable in their presence. And that's because you do not know what to do in the face of someone whose story you cannot easily determine. You don't know what they're like. You don't know if they're going to hurt you. You don't know if they're, un if, they're, if they're dangerous in some regard. You don't know what your obligations are with regards to them. They're already labeled as part of the unknown, so to speak, and you'll give them a relatively wide berth. The only message that, that's really necessary from this particular slide today is the idea that you're always contrasting what you want to happen with what you think is happening. They're both models. And wherever there's a deviation, wherever what you want to happen isn't going on, then you feel anxiety, curiosity as well. You're impelled to explore. But anxiety is the thing that comes up first. And the larger the magnitude of the unexpected occurrence, the greater the amount of anxiety. One of the things we're going to try to determine in the course is how you can understand how large a disruption a given unexpected event is. Because, you know, minor, well, I think, let's go back to this other diagram for a sec. Here's a, like, here's a way of looking at it. So let's say you're, you know, you're going somewhere, and you have three plans to get there. And uh, you, this plan doesn't work, so that means it produces an outcome that isn't what you envisioned. And this plan doesn't work. It produces a, an anomalous outcome as well, but this plan does work. Well, that's no problem. I mean, those are pretty minor league disruptions. All you do is you keep the same vision of yourself and the same vision of the future. You just switch between plans. But you're really in trouble if none of your plans work or if someone messes around with your representation of this or this. So you can say, for example, um, you want to get into medical school. And you need 30 courses to get into medical school. And you should have A's on all of them. And you get a B plus on one course. OK. Well, you still have all these other courses. That's not such a big deal. It's a minor league disruption. It causes you a certain amount of anxiety and produces a certain amount of exploratory behavior. Perhaps you might go to the professor and say, why is it that I got this B plus when I was expecting an A? And don't you know what that's going to do to my vision of the ideal future? And so on and so forth. That's, that's one sort of disruption. You're a bit anxious, but hey, you have 29 other courses, it's not such a big deal. Now, instead, you write the MCAT, and you score in the 15th percentile. Well, now you're in trouble. <laughs> because you have a vision of yourself. You think, this is your version of the unbearable present. You're not a doctor. That's a pain in the neck. But you're a potential doctor. You have the intellectual resources at your disposal, and the educational background, and, and, and the familial... Uh, push, perhaps, <laughs> to make you into a doctor. And so that's what you've conceived yourself as. That's your story about yourself, is you're the, this person with this set number of potentials. And you also have a vision of where it is that you're going. Well, the MCAT score comes back, and you're in the 15th percentile. Well, your, your ideal future, <laughs> it's gone. That's a big problem. Because that means that all of the events that have surrounded you, that surround you now, 
and as far back as you can remember, that were given determinant significance by this particular plan, have all been cast into chaos. Because everything that you've done up to that point has been predicated on the notion that this is where you were going, and that means that the significance that you attributed to everything was attributed to everything in relationship to that goal. You blow out the goal, then all those significances are back up in the air. You have to modify your version of yourself. So what the hell are you going to do now? You're not going to be a doctor. You put a lot of work into this. Plus, it's your whole self-conception. Well, this is gone. This is gone. I mean, this is irrelevant, right? I mean, the other 29 courses, why the hell are you even here now? So, that's one example of the levels at which anomalies can occur. Minor league anomalies, no problem. You just scoot around them and you go to the same place. Major league anomalies, a new ideal future. Now that's part of the reason that people are so prone to ideological conflicts. It's like, this is an ideology, you could say. It has a particular version of the way things are now. You look at communist ideology, it's pretty, it's pretty explicit. What's the unbearable present, so to speak? Well, I know this is a bit dated, but we're running out of hardline ideologies to poke fun at, but, mm -hmm. so I have to use an old one. But, um, the unbearable present is the class struggle, and we have reasons for that. It's basically the fault of the rich who are exploiting the poor. The ideal future is the point at which those unfair divisions of capital are eliminated, and there's a whole bunch of means to that end. That's, that's an ideology. Well, someone else has a different ideology, a different version of the significance of current events, a different version of the significance and, and the nature of the ideal future, and a completely different apprehension of how to transform one to the other. When those two cultures come into contact, well, first of all, they make each other anxious because they're not commensurate. They're not commensurate goals. And if this is the structure that regulates emotion, well, what's going to happen? Well, you can't just give up your damn plans because then your emotions are dysregulated. You fall into chaos, so to speak. You don't know where you are, and you don't know, you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do, and you don't know where you're going. And that makes you anxious. Neither side is going to give up, give up their certainty. Well, the only thing left then under those circumstances is conflict. And you see this. I mean, look, how do, how do arguments escalate? An argue, argument with someone that you love even, they want one thing, you want another. You discuss it, you're not getting anywhere. Your tempers raise because the abstract discussion isn't helping. Finally, you give up. Maybe you move to, to violence to solve your problem, to hammer out the story, so to speak. You can do that by oppressing the person who has a different, a different viewpoint. Okay. So your brain is set up to contrast the, a vision of what you would like with a vision of what's occurring. And when something unexpected occurs, well, there's a whole sequence of emotional processes that are disinhibited. The amygdala governs, governs them by all appearances. It's an extraordinarily ancient organ. It works in concert with the hippocampus. The hippocampus, by the way, evolved in the course of phylogenesis, basically when amphibians left the ocean. So it, this circuitry has been around a long time, a lot longer than your higher cortical centers. It's very sophisticated and it's very powerful. And I think you could say that we spend our whole lives trying to make sure that the amygdala is shut off. So we don't like it when it's on. I mean, maybe you can, that's, again, that's not exactly true because I think a tiny bit of activation under controlled circumstances, that's optimal. But there's a threshold, and, if you, and it differs to some degree from person to person. If you exceed that threshold, there's nothing that you dislike more. Because the amygdala is the thing that says, everything that you are is in danger. We like to keep it shut off. Most of the time, it's shut off. As long as we associate with people who are predictable to us, as long as we know where we're going and things that we predict are occurring, it shuts up, and the cortical centers are in control, and we go down the path that we've chosen. Okay. Now, the other thing I'm interested in is Say, as far as your brain is concerned, let me step one step back. 
What's emotion? Well, emotion is the subjective sensation that you feel when you encounter a situation that has implications for action. So, emotion occupies the space between sensory input and motor output. So if you encounter something that has significance, you feel an emotion. And an emotion is the subjective sense that accompanies the activation or the pre-activation of motor output systems. That's basically how it occur, how it appears. You say, well, you can think of the world the way that we normally think of it, which is as something that exists objectively, uh, something that's amenable to scientific description. Or you can also think of it as a place that's full of things that have implications for actions. Now, as far as stories are concerned, the universe is a place that's full of things that have implications for action. That's the environment from the narrative perspective. The most fundamental substructure of narratives can be found in myths. And the next thing I want to show you is how myths fundamentally represent the world insofar as it's conceived of as something that has implication for behavior, something with emotional significance. See, the, sci the world of the scientific object, so to speak, is devoid of emotional significance, really by design. Part of what you do in the scientific procedure is eradicate anything that's purely subjective, like emotion. If you think a theory is true because you like the theory, that's not sufficient grounds for considering it true from the scientific perspective. You're supposed to make yourself objective, which basically means to eradicate your emotional assessment of, the, of, of, of a given situation. But the thing is, we're always assessing situations for their affective significance. We have to do that because emotion or affect means how to act. And you always have to figure out how to act in every situation. So it's reasonable to construe the world as something that has meaning, as a place where that, that meaning exists. So, well, this is how the world is conceived of from the mythological perspective. It's quite straightforward. I'm not going to talk much about this. The mythological representation of chaos is just the attempt to represent the place that everything comes from before there's any divisions between anything. I don't want to get into that right now. But from the mythological perspective, <coughs> this, is, this is how the world... This is a creation myth, basically. The original thing splits into two components, one of which is the unknown, and the other of which is the known. Now, the known has this structure. It's a story. So if you know something, you know the story that goes along with it, which means that if you know it, if you know a territory, if you've explored a territory, it means you know how to act there. That's all, that's all that I'm trying to emphasize here. And myth, from the mythological perspective, the world is constructed of three things. One is all those things that you don't know. That's the domain of the unpredictable. And it has a priori motivational significance. Which basically means that on first contact, it scares the hell out of you, and then it makes you curious if you stick around long enough. First face it reveals is the one that makes you anxious. That's unexplored territory. That's the, uh, the dark forest, barbarian lands, dark water, the land of the dead. Tiamat as well. Tiamat's a, a dragon from Mesopotamian creation myth from which everything comes, basically. Anything frightening, anything threatening, anything that makes you run away, Anything that's in the dark, anything that's unfamiliar, that all constitutes the unknown from the mythological perspective. That's half the world. It's a division between chaos and order, basically. From the mythological perspective, that's what the universe is composed of. Chaos is divided from order, and that's the world. You live in order, hopefully. Chaos surrounds you, like, a, like the ocean surrounds an island, fundamentally. That's what this diagram is basically trying to represent. The known, the great father. That's culture. The village, the nation, explored territory, the city, the family, the king, the predictable. That's where you live. That's where everything has been transformed from chaos into order, where everything can be predicted. And it sits on top of the unknown. Psychoanalytic interpretations of 
the rationale for social conflict have often posited that what you see in people who you are willing to persecute is your own dark side, those things about you that you're most unwilling to admit. And I think there's a certain amount of truth in that, but what's more accurate and more fundamental and, and, and much less difficult to understand in a sense is that if someone is not familiar to you, you don't have to presume anything about them. The mere fact of their existence as something unfamiliar is already sufficient to give them a certain emotional valence. And that emotional valence, at least on initial contact, is the promotion of anxiety. You don't have to think in some ways about the necessity of projection or your, unre or your, your, your own incomprehensibility to yourself or your propensity to only see the evil in others. Is the mere fact of unpredictability is enough to render someone associated with this domain. That's the thing. I said we classify things in two different ways, in a sense. We classify things from the scientific perspective, but we also classify them from the perspective of their significance for action. And you could say that a natural category is the class of all things that you should run away from. And from the perspective of that sort of classification, everything that is the sort of thing that you should run away from is the same thing. So that means any time you, you encounter something that's unpredictable, it's, that thing is instantly thrown into the category of all the things that have ever frightened you, all the things in your life that you haven't been able to control. Because the idea of the thing that you should run away from is one of the most fundamental types of classification there is. We're always classifying things in terms of their fundamental significance for behavior. I found out, for example, I thought about that, I guess about six or seven years ago. I was reading Mircea Eliade. There are many, crea many creation myths. The world comes out of the body of a dragon. For example, in the Mesopotamian creation myth, Marduk versus Taimat. Taimat is a dragon who lives at the bottom of the ocean. And she's the mother of all the gods. But they make a lot of noise and irritate her. They also kill her husband. And this makes her quite mad, so she decides she's going to eat them all. And one of the Mesopotamian gods named Marduk is elected by the other gods to go and fight with the time out. And uh, he encloses her in a net and cuts her into pieces. And out of the pieces, he makes the world. He creates order from chaos. He's the third feature of the mythological world, by the way. There's the unknown, and there's the known, and there's the process that mediates between them. Turns one into the other. That's the hero. Marduk's the hero. He cuts up the dragon and makes the world. So he's assimilated to a creator god, basically. The reason I'm telling you this story now, though, is because I found out from Iliad that many archaic cultures, the Iranians and the Egyptians, there were three others whose names I don't remember at the moment, the symbol that they used for the stranger or the barbarian was the same symbol they used to represent the chaos that predated the construction of the world. So you can, this is so interesting if you grab the, Chris, grab, grasp the significance of that, because it meant that Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, for example, never let a foreigner into one of their temples because the foreigner would bring chaos into order. The foreigner was chaos. That's the thing for the Egyptian. The foreigner was chaos. They used the same symbol. That's how people think. That is how we think. It's like, if you're not from the same tribe, however that's defined, most, most fundamentally it would be the family, but obviously we've abstracted that up into the nation or into an ideological unit or whatever. If you're not us, then you are chaos. And all by yourself under those circumstances, if you're an agent of chaos, you have emotional significance. Here's something I, don't, I can't predict. I'm afraid of things I can't predict. You're a threat to me. Well, the path from that to, to oppressing you is not a very, very, uh, it's a very short one. Well, one of the things we're going to study to a fair degree is mythological representations of the world. It's, I find this extremely interesting, and the reason for this is because as soon as you know, as soon as you know that we use stories to regulate our emotions, and as soon as you know that there are two types of information that we need to gather, one being factual information and the other information about how we should behave, then you have the uh, possibility of reading mythological accounts, or stories in general, from a completely different perspective. Because you don't have to think anymore, well, 
this mythological account, for example, of the creation of the world, has no relationship whatsoever to evolutionary theory. We know evolutionary theory is more accurate. Therefore, this whole sequence of accounts has to be cast into the realm of like pseudoscience or superstition. Well, then you lose all the information that's in those stories. As soon as you know that those stories aren't concerned in the least with the construction of the objective world, but are concerned with the world as it, as it has significance, well, then you have a whole new way of approaching them, a whole new mode of interpreting them. And you can start to understand the nature of the stories that actually underlie our culture. And believe me, that's so, that's so useful. Well, it's so useful you can hardly believe it. You find all of a sudden that all these stories that you've heard since your earliest days, stories that are basically rationally incomprehensible, as soon as you twist your presuppositions about their origins, just, just 45 degrees, then you can see the order in them and exactly what it is that they're trying to, trying to put forth. And they all of a sudden make sense. Well, I think knowing this, regardless of its implications for social conflict, knowing that, getting a key to the meaning of these stories, that's worth having to plow your way through all the information that you have to read in this course. Because you'll, I'll tell you, you'll go see things, see movies and, and uh, read novels and look at myths and you'll think, oh, I know what that means now. Isn't it, isn't it so interesting that that's what it means? You can immediately see the relationship between the story and your own, and the position that you occupy in the, in the midst of things. It's very fascinating. So we're interested in representation. Well, here I want to read you a bit of a story here. It said, the unknown is the great and terrible mother. Well, you know, you're going to have to accept that, my word for that at the moment. But the, the basic notion is a feminine imagery tends, tends to be used to represent the unknown. And the reason for that is because the unknown is the mother of all things. And that's obviously a very mystical way of thinking about it. But all I mean is this. Every bit of, as far as the myth is concerned, information is the world. Okay, that's the known. All the information that you generate, you generate in contact, as a consequence of your contact with something you didn't understand. Which is only to say that you generate information by exploring. It's not very, that's obvious. Well, then it's not much of a step from there to construing the thing that you're investigating, which is the unknown, as the source of everything perfectly reasonable presupposition. And it's not such a difficult leap to make to construe the source of everything as something feminine, thing, something that gives birth to things. Anyways, it doesn't matter if you follow that train of logic or not, or if you accept it. That is the case, and that is how myths tend to represent the unknown. So uh, one of the books that you're going to read is called The Great Mother, and that's a work by Eric Newman, and it is, it's 300 pages of description of mythological representations of the feminine. Anyways, that's the mythological aspect. I want to read you a good story about rats, because I want to show you how deeply grounded these sorts of notions are. I want to tell you a little story first before I read this. I was watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon the other day with my kids, and um, you're probably more or less familiar with the Bugs Bunny cartoon characters. There's a sheepdog and a, and a wolf, and they go to work in the morning, and Sheepdog's job is to guard the sheep, and the wolf's job is to eat them, and they punch the time clock in, and then they go into their <laughs> respective roles. Anyways, the sheepdog is always beating the wolf up badly, and he gets the real rough end of the stick. Now, there's one scene there. The sheepdog is sitting on a cliff watching the sheep, and it's raining, and the wolf gets a bright idea. He's going to put hair <laughs> tonic on the sheepdog's head, okay? And it's raining so that the sheepdog won't notice. So he sneaks up behind the sheep, and he puts hair tonic on his head, and hair grows down over his eyes. Right. Now, so the sheepdog's sitting there, and the wolf climbs up the cliff. And the first thing he does is he has a hand, a glove on his stick. So he's hiding behind the cliff, and he puts the hand on the stick, and he raises it in front of the sheepdog's face. No response. Now, that wolf is exploring unexplored territory, and it does it cautiously. It sticks his stick up there. Nothing happens. So then the next thing he does is he just pokes his head up and goes right down, and it looks. Nothing terrible happens. So then it climbs up on top of the cliff and it waves its hand in front of the sheepdog. It's starting to smile now. It thinks it's pretty smart. Now it's jumping up and down and so on. Okay, so it's explored the territory. It's mapped it. Originally, the unexplored territory was anxiety provoking. The wolf underwent a whole sequence of exploratory activities, mapped the territory, it's safe. So then it's off to steal a sheep. Okay, that's funny. It was funny because animators are great at 
picking out what we do and exaggerating them. So they're comical. That's exploring unknown territory. Okay. Most of the time when behavioral psychologists teach a rat to be afraid, and that's what they think they're doing, they take a rat that's secure. So they presume that the natural state of the rat is secure. But the only bloody reason the rat's secure is because it's already explored its cage. So you put a rat in a cage and it'll freeze because it's scared. And then if nothing terrible happens to it, it unfreezes and then it slowly starts to explore and it might just move its eyes first and sniff and then if nothing terrible happens it starts to move and soon it checks out the whole cage and if nothing is in there that it's, that's going to kill it, it has a nap or whatever, maybe it looks for some food, but it has to explore before it's secure. Now, more modern animal psychologists, ethologists are starting to study the reactions of things like rats in their natural habitat and that's what this story is about. So you take a rat and rats, they're social set them up in a burrow and they let them set up their burrow and they map out their territory by exploring so they have this whole burrow system set up and the rats know it nothing's dangerous there that's home put a cat in one section of it okay that's this story when a cat is presented to an established mixed sex group of laboratory rats living in the visible burrow the behaviors of the subjects change dramatically in many cases for 24 hours or more the initial active defensive behavior flight to the tunnel chamber system. So the rats are cruising along where they think it's safe, and there's a cat. Well, it's like home into the burrow. It's followed by a period of immobility during which the rats make 22 kilohertz ultrasonic vocalization, which apparently serve as alarm cries at a high rate. So they're, to put it, uh, they're freaked out fundamentally. They run home and scream. They're frozen, and they scream. Like, <laughs> they must be screaming something like, oh no, there's a cat. And all the other rats hear this. And they're all in their burrows. They're terrified. They're frozen into immobility by the appearance of this unexpected thing. As freezing breaks up, it's interesting. Think of a good myth as Perseus and the Gorgon. Show the face of the Gorgon. It's this female head that's covered with snakes. That's an image of the unknown. That thing turns you to stone. Anyways, as freezing breaks up, proxemic avoidance of the open area gradually gives way to a pattern of risk assessment of the area where the cat was encountered. Okay, so the rats are frozen, and they think, you know, oh no, death is around the corner. They don't precisely think that, but that's how they act. And if nothing happens that's also terrible, well, they start to relax a little bit. And as soon as they start to relax, the circuitry, like they're very curious about this unexpected occurrence, but they're overwhelmed by anxiety. They don't do any exploring. They run back and make sure that nothing terrible happens, just like that wolf did with the sheepdog. They run back, and as their anxiety recedes, their curiosity starts to predominate. So they go back to the open area. Subjects poke their heads out of the tunnel openings to scan the open area where the cat was presented for minutes or hours before emerging. So they're like watching. This is new territory now. There is not supposed to be a cat there. So let's just see what happens. So they're watching and watching and remapping the territory. When they do emerge, their locomotory patterns are characterized while well, they kind of run flat so they can't be seen. But the thing that's really neat is they do short corner runs. I think this is so interesting. So you think, here's the area that the cat was seen, okay? So it's like, cat, <laughs> right? Now the rats saw the cat there, so this is, this is all of a sudden being re-novelized, this area. It was once mapped and made secure, but the appearance of the cat there has thrown their plans for a loop. So what do the rats do? Well, the cat's disappeared, but they don't trust this area anymore because it was associated with the cat. So they do corner runs. The bravest of rats leaps out of his tunnel and runs right across a small area. And if, if he doesn't get killed, that's safe. So then he runs back, takes another chunk out of it. Safe. The rats are doing the same thing. Soon, if there's no cat, the whole area is mapped again. These risk assessment areas appear to involve active gathering of information about possible danger sources providing a basis for a gradual return to non-defensive behaviors. Active risk assessment is not seen during early post-cat exposure, but rises to a peak about 10 hours later. These rats are scared. Non-defensive behaviors such as eating, drinking, and sexual aggressive activity tend to be reduced over the same period. Uh, that's because the anxiety system just predominates. It's like you don't think about anything else when there's a cat around. So it's such a, such a great story because you get an idea of how the rat's universe is set up. It's like, there's known territory, and then there's unknown territory. And when known, and known territory can turn into unknown territory as soon as something unpredictable happens. And when something unpredictable happens, 
that whole area is, is made novel again, and the rats have to undergo this very complex pattern of exploratory activity to make their territory secure again. So that's, that's quite interesting. Now it's also the case, well, I, I gave you here a representation of novelty. That's what novelty does to people. It's half threat, which may, produces anxiety. It's half promise. It impels exploratory activity. Anxiety comes up first. This has been known among behavioral psychologists for about five decades. It's like, uh, the exploratory and anxiety circuitry are mutually inhibitory, but the anxiety circuitry has the upper edge in terms of potency and rapidity of rise, fundamentally. So, uh, okay. So, let me show you something. Oh, it's also the case. So, rats, they identify each other by smell. And if you smell like you should smell, then you're familiar. You're not contaminated with the unknown. So your behavior is predictable, which basically means that I know your place in the dominance hierarchy. I know what role you play with all the other animals. And I know how to behave in your presence. You're familiar. You're kin. And I can tell that if I'm a rat by the way that you smell. Okay, so you take a rat that everyone loves, and you pull it out of its cage, and you wash it off. And you throw it back in with the rats, they kill it. Because that rat is now contaminated with the unknown. And we don't like to have the unknown around because it upsets our predictability. And when our predictability gets upset, then our anxiety levels rise and, and all hell breaks loose. And literally all hell breaks loose because actually hell is a mythological representation of the unknown. At least that's it in part. Now, from the mythological perspective, the world has three constituent elements. The unknown, which is everywhere. The known, and the process by which one is turned into the other, which is basically exploration. So, the knower is the archetypical, archetypal pattern of exploration. The thing that mediates between the unknown and the known. And from the mythological perspective, part of the process that creates the world. See, that's, the, that's absolutely fascinating, too, if you think about it for a minute. Because you can think about something like the fact of, say, you take our democratic system now. Our democratic system is deeply rooted in religious presuppositions, many of which we forget now, but it doesn't really matter. They're still there. They're implicit. They're there. Now, one of the implicit presumptions is that every individual in our society is worthy of respect. That's the core aspect of your natural right, fundamentally. Even if you're a criminal, like even if you've broken rules that you admit you've broken, in this society and others that have the same presuppositions, you, you still have a whole sequence of rights that cannot be violated. Because in principle, there's something about you that's worthy of respect, regardless of your behavior. But the question is, what is that? What is that? Well, you think, you even see this in simpler social animals like wolves. Wolves, well, they live in social groups, they have dominance hierarchies, and wolves are always trying to climb up the dominance hierarchy, which is good for the wolf pack, because the strongest animal, more or less, the most competent animal should be at the top. But anyways, if one wolf fights with another wolf, they very seldom injure each other if they're in the same group, which is good because you don't want the group diminished by constant intergroup, intra-group conflict. Well, the top wolf, the wolf who wins the conflict, which is usually more of threat posturing than actual physical engagement, although sometimes a real fight breaks up. If the wolf that loses the dominance dispute manifests submissive behaviors, which basically means it rolls over and shows its throat, which means you can kill me now if you want, the top wolf stops. And you can say, well, the stronger wolf acts as if it's constrained by knowledge that even the weaker members of the group still can conceivably contribute something of value to the group. Well, that's what we're like, too, in our group organizations, except we've got, we've got that principle up almost to the point where we understand it. It's the individual who, in contact with the unknown, generates information. And that information constitutes the group. And the individual is valuable because they are, in fact, assimilated to, from the mythological perspective, to the force that creates the world, which is basically the force that renders the unknown predictable or that creates order out of chaos. You say the aspect of people that's divine, theoretically, is the part that stands on the border between the unknown and the known. And that moves information from unexplored territory into explored territory, expanding the, do the dominion of the group. That's anyways. OK, who's this? This is Kelly, the devourer. 
she's a negative mother, so to speak, from the mythological perspective. And I find her very interesting. She's the best representation of this sort of thing that I've ever seen. Now, if the myth that you think, myths, they last a long time, sometimes tens of thousands of years, and they, they often even last across cultures. And you think, well, what the hell is it? What could a story actually be telling you that could be useful given that much change? Well, the mythological world that stories are concerned with is composed of three things. The unknown, well, it's always there. It doesn't matter when you live or where you live or who you are. That's part of your experience. It's always going to be part of your experience. It doesn't matter how much you know. There's always things that you can't predict. The more you know, well, the more potential problems there are because knowledge in itself even breeds new problems. That's always there. The fact of culture is always there. Right? I mean, the cultures may change, but the fact that there's culture and that you're a product of culture and that you have to add to it or at least establish some relationship to it that it protects you and creates you and that you contribute to it, that never changes. And the fact that you're the intermediary between those two forces, that never changes. And that's what myth describes, those three things. This is a representation of the unknown. The unknown is also, as well as being the thing that gives rise to everything, it's also the thing that destroys everything. It's, un it's the things that we cannot control that in the final analysis lead to our demise. It's our ignorance that causes our death, in a sense. We just can't stop something. We can't stop aging. We can't stop disease. We can't stop starvation. Those are all things that we haven't got a grip on. They're all things that are still unknown and unpredictable. And sooner or later, they get us. So let's look at Kelly. So the first thing I'd like to say is that I said the unknown automatically frightens us. There are other things that automatically frighten us, more or less. There's some dispute about this in the behavioral literature. There are things that you can learn to become afraid of very easily. Spiders, snakes, fire, blood, skeletons, disembodied bodies. I mean, those are all elements of horror movies. It's pretty obvious that people are more or less afraid of them. It's not that difficult to figure out why. The only debate in the, in the, bio, in the psychological literature is whether those fears are actually innate or whether you have to acquire them through very brief exposure. It doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. The point is, is that those things might be regarded as... Um, extraordinarily appropriate representatives of the unknown. What's myth trying to do? It's trying to encapsulate behavioral wisdom. Under what circumstances? In what world? Well, the answer to that is in the world that's composed of the unknown, the known, and the mediating force. If you have to adapt to the unknown, which you have to do, the thing to do, logically, say you have an infinite amount of time at your disposal, is to come up with a representation of what the unknown is. A strange thing to do because you don't know what it is. So the question is, how the hell can you represent it? But the one thing you do know about it that's always the case is that it makes you afraid and it makes you curious. So if you want to make a representation of it, then you use those things that you do know something about that either make you afraid or curious. So let's look at this figure. A figure to whom, whom at some point in history, and not so long ago, human sacrifices were actually offered. And we're, at, we're going to look a little bit at the reasons for that. This is Kelly. She is the thing that everything goes back to. She's a representative of the unknown. Well, let's look at her. Now, she's something that produces religious devotion in those who apprehend her presence. Seizure of meaning, fundamentally, which you could assimilate to a religious experience. She has eight legs like a spider. She spins the web of faith. That's the reason. The web is made out of fire. Her hair is on fire, too, by the way. Uh, she sits in the middle of that web. She has a headdress of skulls and usually has a, a snake around her waist. A snake's a symbol of transformation because it sheds its skin, so theoretically it's something that's reborn. But anyways, um, she often has staring eyes and protruding teeth, which is something else that people are pretty much uh, innately predisposed to respond to. And she is so, in her hands are tools of creation and destruction. And she's simultaneously giving birth to this gentleman and eating him. But that is a symbol of that. And I would say, well, okay, now you understand two things. You understand that you have an innate response to the unknown, and that it's a permanent constituent element of experience from the perspective of emotion. And if you look at a figure like that, then you can get some apprehension of what it is that people are trying to avoid contact with when they attempt to maintain things predictably. Okay, and...
Well, I'm just going to close this, I guess. Um, this is a hint about the second part of the course. So the first part of the course, well, is going to, there's, more, there's a lot more detail to this story than I ran across today. And there's some complicating factors that make the whole story much more interesting. Oh, it's, I mean, it, this is interesting already. I think this is the most, this is, has something to do with hope, let's say. You're innately predisposed to respond to the unpredictable with anxiety, and perhaps to eliminate it if you can. You can understand why that is, but you need to be able to predict your circumstances. You have to be able to. You can't just give up your story or your culture because that throws you completely into chaos. And that's unpleasant, as unpleasant as anything you could imagine. But other people believe different things. And obviously, when you come into contact with them, well, there's a high likelihood of aggression. And the aggression of such magnitude that there's a good probability that you'll be destroyed and so will the person that you're aggressing against. That doesn't really strike you as, you know, all that great a solution. On the one hand, if you give up your ideas, well, then you're subject to affective dysregulation of, of the most intolerable sort. On the other hand, if you pursue your particular ideas in the face of opposition, then you might run into a circumstance where aggression is inevitable and that'll be the end of you. This is a bad sort of paradox. Well, so what can be done about that? Well, that has, I guess you could say, to give you the answer in the tiniest sort of nutshells, it has something to do with your attitude towards anomalous information. You have the highest likelihood of not falling into this sort of trap if when something unexpected happens to you, you register it and you explore to see why it was that you were wrong, to accept the fact of the anomalous information and to explore it. This is a neat figure, and I'll close with the discussion, just a brief discussion of this. That's a bodhisattva. It's an Eastern image that I suppose you could assimilate to some degree to Christ in the West. It's an image of the hero, and the hero is the intermediary process between the known and the unknown. Hero is some person who goes out where it's frightening. See this in dragon stories. I should have mentioned that one. I should. Dragon, dragons, they live in the bottom of a mountain and they sit on a treasure. And if you want the treasure, you go out of your community that's threatened by the dragon. If you want the treasure, you go to its lair, you overcome the dragon, and bring back the treasure. When you come back, then your community is transformed. Well, that's a story about exploration. It says the dragon is the thing that's simultaneously threatening and promising, as well as archaic and ancient and powerful. The hero is the person who leaves the community to encounter that, that archetypal phenomena, to overcome it, to get the treasure, to bring it back to the community, which is therefore enriched. That's the path of the hero. This, this is a very interesting image. That figure, you see the attempt by the author to make it recurring, right? And this is, this is the sky, by the way. And this might be conceived of as a tunnel. But it's a tunnel into time, not into space. This is the most, this is the present, and this is the past as it extends back as far as can possibly be imagined. This figure sits on the, I know, I know it's kind of blurry and that's unfortunate, but let's see here. See these figures at the bottom? These are figures that are very much like Kelly. Same sort of thing. And this representation is this figure triumphing, in a sense, over this figure. And this, uh, this is surrounded by fire as well. Again, that's a symbol of transformation. This is an attempt to portray the fact that the pattern of behavior that is characteristic of the hero is something that constantly recurs through time. That's an archetype from the Jungian perspective. It says, the fact of exploration and the tendency for exploration that's an inbuilt part of the human psyche. It's biologically predicated. You, it, it, it's, part of the, it's part of the apparatus that you inherit, so to speak. And it's nothing to do with inherited memories or anything, anything that abstract. It, it just has to do with the fact that that's the sort of creature you are. You're always, you always serve as the intermediary between unexplored territory and explored territory, and that's true no matter where you live. This is a figure that, well, that is a drawing that attempts to represent that idea pictorially. It's a very complicated idea. Most religious traditions, perhaps without exception, of course there's always exceptions, are predicated on the notion that identity, identity with this figure, identification with this figure, 
is necessarily at the core of proper human adaptation. And without that identification, and chaos will necessarily reign. Okay. Sure. So, does everybody have a syllabus? Okay, does everybody have the directions to the coffee shop? Okay. Yeah. Physiology of cognition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's actually some of the ideas that are in well in the class are derived in part from some from some of the basics. Yeah, that's the um, Descartes' error. Descartes error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, if you just put your name down, they'll, they'll charge you to your term bill. Okay. okay, your name and your student ID number. Oh, that's yours? Yes. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Did one of them open the door? Oh, good. Okay. What's the policy of audit? Well, you're welcome to audit. So, that's, that's my policy, anyways. So, uh. It's not that we just cover it. Well, that, that would be best. I mean, if that, that's really my concern. Is that you know, sure? Yep. That's fine. Yep. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And what's this? What's the problem? Um, down here. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, I guess I'll have Thanks. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I don't have my form yet, but um. Yeah, okay, whatever. Um, papers from last. Yeah, time. they're done. They're marked. They're downstairs in my office. I'm going to put them out on the bench, huh? and uh, you can just pick them up, or you can come down with me here in a minute or two. And okay, I'll okay. You. Okay. Whoop. Course number? 2435. Yeah, no, because I have a sabbatical next year. Uh, so uh, it's it's not a good idea. You should find someone who'll be around. Yeah, I know. I just found out about it. Yeah, as long as, the, as long as you're convinced that you can that, Yeah, it's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Second question. Twelve bucks or something. It's not very expensive. Okay. Thanks. Like a socially accepted way of expressing aggression. 
profession. Right, right. But there's not really anyone you can point to in the department and be like, oh, he or she is perfect. You might try Rich McNally. He's the only one I can think of, really, that it might be relevant. If you have a, like a well thought out project that you've already worked on, you shouldn't have too much trouble finding something.